Welcome to the Constellation Class FFG-62 Ship Brief. This is the newest American warship that is being getting construction this year. So we're going to do a ship brief now uh, with all the design documents of what they promised us, how much it's expected to cost, and when the ship begins testing in 2026, about four years from now, we'll do another video, a follow-up, and see what we actually got and compare it to this one. All right, so let's get started with uh, the sub brief. First, my sources. This is uh, an open source intelligence briefing, uh, which means it's all public knowledge, unclassified. My sources are the Navy itself, navy.mil. I also use the Congressional Research Services and Budget Offices for uh, cost information, estimated cost, because they tend to be a little more reliable than what the Navy puts out. We'll talk about that in this lecture. Uh, BAE Systems and Seaforces.org had great individual systems information and pictures, so we uh, use them for that. WarriorMaven.com, fantastic website. He is the chief editor for NationalInterest.org as well. I recommend you check out both sites. He has a great article on this ship. And then Defense Today, Korea, and SocialLinks.io, we got some graphics from, so credit to those websites for that. Our story begins in April 30th, 2020, when the DDC contract was awarded to Finna Kateri, Marine Marriott, or Marriott Marine uh, in Marriott, Wisconsin, uh, was awarded the contract. The initial contract is for 10 ships, and it's a one plus nine optional, whereas they build one, and they're gonna do some land testing uh, before they build it, and then after it's built, test it again. And if everything's fine, they're gonna go ahead and continue all the way up to 10 ships with this initial contract. Now, a extension on this contract of up to 20 ships is already going through the works and is gonna be expected to be approved. So you may see some reports out there that we're gonna initially build 20 ships. That will be true eventually, but not at the time of this recording. Okay, this is a blue water and littoral water warship. So this is a great replacement for the lit littoral combat ship. It has a lot more capability uh, in terms of offense and defense than the LCS had. And it can do a lot of the <clears throat> shallow water missions that LCS was very good at. And it also has a blue roll capability. So it can be with the fleet, high speed and perform that function. We're gonna break down all the systems here, but this is a multi-role ship. Uh, imagine it as a little bit smaller Arleigh Burke, because it's very capable. All right, so we went with the parent design approach for this. That means you start with a ship that's already built and functioning in another Navy, or even in our Navy, a parent ship, and then you change that ship the hull of it to fit your needs. So you already have a lot of the systems already tested. You don't need to create the wheel again. We're using the Frem frigate as a baseline for this, and we're gonna make some minor changes to it, like lengthening the hull to 496 feet from its original length, and increasing the displacement to up to 7,300 tons approximately. And that's gonna depend on if all these systems that we're gonna talk about today get uh, installed. Um, they've added a lot to this little ship which is after the LCS is, is a great, great choice. Okay, so here were the, were the Navy requirements uh, whenever people were making their bids for this design that Finnecateri eventually won. Uh, they want the Enterprise Air Surve Surveillance Radar installed. So that's the miniaturized version of the Spy 6. They come in two by two blocks like we'll talk about. We're gonna break all these systems down for you. So don't worry if you don't understand these right away. Baseline 10 Aegis Combat System is our most capable con combat system. It fits on board this ship and uh, it's pretty incredible. It's gonna have the Mark 41 VLS on the bow, like you see there. It's gonna carry 32 vertical launch missiles. There was a proposal to increase this to 48 missiles, so you may see 48 in other future lectures as well, but right now that's not approved, it's 32. Amidships, the box launchers topside are for the Naval Strike Missile. Four box launchers of four missiles apiece, facing port and starboard. On the aft superstructure top side, you see the 21 cell rolling airframe missile launcher holds 21 missiles. It's only about a five mile range. It's more like for point defense or fleet defense than anything else of, a Navy, of uh, incoming air, whether it's missile or helicopter or airplane. And then the uh, Mark 110 57 millimeter gun on the bow, very reliable, it's been used for years gun. Uh, that's really the hallmark of this ship is they're taking systems that have already been in service for a long time and putting them on here. There's no new systems on hull one. You know, we're, we're learning the lessons of new technologies on new ships and just making sure that we don't put anything new on this ship. Everything's already been built and is already in use. 
the Hilo uh, or Seahawk capable helideck is on the back. We also have a rib boat mission module, as you can see there. And it will have a toad array. I believe I know the toad array, but they didn't make it public. So uh, whenever they do, we'll talk about what that is. And the electronic and information warfare suite. This ship does have an information warfare role and that is highly sensitive it is not public so we will not talk about that at all and of course it does have comms and countermeasures countermeasures being chaff and flare and of course electronic warfare like we mentioned all right so the enterprise air search radar or esar uh, combined with the baseline 10 aegis combat system is a one-two punch for surveillance and um you know counter detection of, of other targets, whether it's, you know, a surface contact or an air contact. This radar is very accurate, has a high fidelity rate. It's ease of use and integration for the operator. Um, it, it's, it's our top of the line and it looks great. So this is what they're putting on the ship here. Um, the module blocks are in two by two foot sections and this one's gonna have a row of uh, three by three for a total of nine uh, mounted on the ship there. And it's got 360 degree coverage. It can engage multiple targets at the same time, whether they're coming from uh, space like a ballistic missile or if it's engaging a ship simultaneously. Yeah, very capable. Here's the uh, Mark 41 VLS. Uh, like I said, it's gonna have 32 vertical launch missiles. It can shoot the Tomahawk missile, uh, all the standard missiles, whether it's two, three or six. Uh, it's got a vertical launch anti-submarine rocket, which is basically an anti-submarine, can either be a bomb or an airdrop torpedo, and the evolved Sea Sparrow, which is a surface-to-air missile. Uh, the Naval Strike Missile is, again, one of the newest uh, anti-ship missiles in the United States inventory. It will have a deck-mounted box launcher. It is sea-skimming, subsonic, goes about 100 miles, and has uh, multiple ways of homing in on target, one of which is infrared homing, and it uses a proximity fuse. It does have stealth-like characteristics, but all of that uh, specific information is not uh, public. So we won't talk about it. But 21 cell rolling launcher there, you can see the picture of it. This is installed on a lot of American ships already. Tested system, works very well. 21 shots. And it does radar homing and also tracks infrared too. And has dual use, can do both at the same time uh, to make sure it doesn't miss its intended target. And on the right, you see there the Mark 110, 57 millimeter gun, uh, commonly spoken, Bofors 57. And uh, so you may hear that around, it's the same gun as that if you hear that. 220 rounds a minute, pretty rapid fire. Shells can go up to nine miles and it is radar targeted, but you can also take manual control and uh, have your way with it. So the future small surface combatant force levels, the Navy eventually wants to build up to 60 small surface combatants. So they don't all have to be uh, this particular frigate, but it th this frigate will take up a good chunk of the 40 to 60 goal that the Navy has of these SSCs by 2050. Uh, this will require increased production uh, to greater than two a year, which means they're gonna bring on a second ship builder. Uh, it could be and probably will be Astral USA because they're currently building the other LCS class uh, down there in Mobile, Alabama. That class is being decommissioned and discontinued. That opens up shipbuilding dry docks to build something different. So Austral has experience with small combat vessels. Uh, they have the availability, which is really important right now. So it looks like they're gonna be the ones that get the contract, even though it's not approved yet. I would keep my eye on Astral USA. Other shipyards that already build really good warships for us is General Dynamics and Huntington Ingalls. Uh, so you could see them in the mix as well. There is talk that if they're gonna build up to eight a year, which is not the plan, but if they wanna go that route, they will have to bring on a third shipyard. So my money is on Astral USA getting the second contract and either General Dynamics or Huntington Ingalls getting a third if they go that route, uh, depending on availability. And I'm talking about the availability of assembly buildings to build this, because that's really where we're limited. You know, we've got the money, we're willing to spend it. We've got the people, uh, we've got the intent, but we just need the dry docks and the assembly buildings to get these things going. And then there's a proposal out there in the Navy to go to a two crew system. And I really like this. This worked really well for our ballistic missile submarines. And what this means is you have a blue crew and a gold crew for one ship. And there's some downsides to that, but the really good upsides is that ship comes into port with a crew that's had it to sea for five, six months, you know, however long, basically a whole deployment could be nine, 10 months. 
and they come in and they're pretty exhausted. They do a crew turnover over a couple day period and they begin a refit process. That's where they do all the maintenance together as two crews, you know, helping each other. One crew doing like painting and shipping and taking care of the hull that our ships desperately need. And the crew that just took responsibility for the ship would be doing all the system maintenance and stuff because they're going to be the ones operating the ship for the next, you know, nine, 10 months, however long the next deployment is. And then uh, whenever that ship gets out of that refit period, whether it's one month or three months and deploys again, um, you know, that's a quick turnaround versus having an older rotation where a ship would go to sea once every other year, once every 18 months, you're getting a ship to sea back to sea in a couple month period. That's a big benefit. It also gives the crew a break away from the ship so they can go into the classroom environment and the simulator environment and train and hone their skills and learn new qualifications that they then when they the ship comes back in nine ten months and they become the operational crew they're still fresh and they have new skills classroom you know textbook skills that they can bring on board the ship and employ those are the big benefits a higher operation tempo you get more sea time out of your ship the crew is rested and ready and the ships are better maintained because you have more people with more time doing it the big downside to that is the manpower. You literally need two crews, twice as many people, officers and sailors. There are two captains, there are two cobs. You know, it's complete two, two different crews. And so manning could be an issue preventing that. If you're gonna build 40 to 60 of these, that's 80 to 120 crews. That's, that's a lot of people. So we'll see if they actually go that route. It works for the ballistic missile submarines, but we only have a couple of over, a, just over a dozen of those, right? And uh, we're, we're downsizing that actually with the Columbia class. Okay, so let's talk about procurement costs real quick. Like I said, no new technologies, no new systems. There is very little risk or it's decreased the risk of something going wrong with the systems because of that. In 2020, uh, the very first hull was funded. Um, the Navy said it would take about $1.3 billion to get Hull 1 built. Congress, you know, accepted that uh, on, you know, on face value. And then the next year comes along and they're saying because of the lessons learned or we're going to learn on Hull 1, the next two hulls will be a little bit cheaper, mostly in manpower savings, because we're going to get better at building these ships. And that's reasonable. That history does, you know, reflect that. But uh, that's in 2021, Congress, learning from the LCS program, said we're not going to accept even Hull 1 until you, uh, a very, you know, project leader, do some land-based testing with these systems working together. Even though these systems are already out in the fleet, we want to make sure that these things are working together on a land-based simulator or trainer um, or on, on a, in a, in a uh, range, war range before we take the first one. And then they that's when they approved the $1.1 billion for Hull 2. This year, 2022, they did fund another Constellation class and that will be $1.1 billion. These are all Navy numbers. The Navy thinks that's how much it's gonna cost. So I go over to the Congressional Budget Office and we'll see what they say after reviewing the Navy's requirements and the number of systems that are gonna be on this ship. They believe, the CBO believes, the cost will actually be 17% to 56% higher than the 1.3 billion cost for hull one. And that's gonna be averaged out over 10 hulls. So it's, it's, it's gonna be that much higher for each hull. And so that's up to you know, $60 million in additional cost in 2021 dollars. They're using previous year dollars. Keep in mind for 2022, we've had an inflation spike, which is gonna drive this cost up even higher. Okay. and. That also doesn't take into account year to year inflation. They went out 10 years using $2,021. So obviously this 17 to 56% is gonna go up every year. All right, that's a lot of money that is not accounted for yet in the budget. So uh, in April, 2020, the contract was awarded for 10 ships, but the contract to Finna Kintiri was only $5.6 billion. That is approximately half what even the Navy said it was gonna cost to build 10 ships. And this part confuses me, I cannot find an answer for this. So if anyone knows why the contract gives the shipyard half the cost, um, is it gonna be you know, amortized over the next 10 years, the, the remaining cost? That's what I suspect may happen. If anyone knows, put it down in the comments for us, okay? And uh, Congress's response is requiring land-based testing, like I said, to try and 
make sure the system actually works on day one. Uh, but I don't know why the initial contract was for only half the expected cost. All right, so Captain Kevin Smith, he is the frigate program manager. He is the sole person responsible uh, for making this program work. So if anything goes wrong, we know who to go to. And I wouldn't want to be Kevin right now. I hope he does a great job. I hope this, he's already got a great tool set. We're off on a good path. Everything looks good on paper, but so did the LCS. Okay, I remember that distinctly in the early 2000s. So hopefully they can get this ship. I, I wish Captain Kevin Smith all the luck in the world to make sure that this ship gets out of the dry dock and into testing with all the systems on board that we've talked about today. And it's his responsibility to do that. Something that they've uh, added to the contract was a $5 million per ship warranty repair by the shipyard. But after some further investigation, I found that the Department of Defense, as a guideline generally on all contracts, does not require any warranty repair work. But in this program, there is a $5 million warranty repair that the shipyard will pay for this $1.3 billion ship. So I guess they'll, they'll take care of minor repairs. After that, the Navy is on the hook for the rest. All right, so there it is, folks. This is our new FFG-62 class, the Constellation class, a modified Frem uh, frigate. Um, and we'll see what they come up with in a couple of years. So we'll revisit this topic a few times. And we expect the ship cost to actually be anywhere from 1.1 billion on the low end for hulls two and three, all the way up to 1.7 billion per ship on the high end. And we'll see what the, act the cost actually comes out to. All right, this has been the Constellation Ship Ship Brief. <laughs> Thank you for watching. Take care, everybody. Bye.